Hi, everyone, and welcome to week 10 of Introduction to Logic. Today, we're going to be making the transition from looking at propositional logic, which we've been looking at for the last several weeks, to a new type of logic called predicate logic. Let's go ahead and dive in and talk about the differences between these two systems of logic. In propositional logic, if you remember, the basic units are statements. Capital letters stood for statements or propositions, which are either true or false. That is, they have a truth value. In predicate logic, however, statements are broken down into even more basic components. And if for any given statement, this is like basic grammar 101. Hopefully this is a review of uh, just basic English for all of you guys. Um, statements consist of two parts, a subject and a predicate. A subject is the subject of the statement and the predicate is what you're claiming is, is true about that statement. So in predicate logic, the goal is to represent categorical statements and demonstrate the validity of arguments that rely on categorical relationships. And by categorical relationships, I mean statements that use words like this, all, no, or some, all some things or something. A good example would be like, all cats are felines, or, or something like, some mountains are over 14,000 feet tall. You're basically making a statement about which um, objects go in which categories or the relationship between different categories of objects. And for some arguments in logic, you need to be able to break down statements into their subjects and predicates to be able to show that those statements are valid because those arguments rely on categorical relationships. So before we dive in, let's talk about the components of predicate logic. So the predicate logic is, a, is visually a bit more complicated than, than propositional logic. So right off the bat, I don't want you to panic when you start looking at propositional, excuse me, uh, statements in predicate logic from your textbook or from your homework. I want you to work up to it using this video as a guide to working up to these fairly complex expressions in, in predicate logic. But here are the components of predicate logic. Predicate logic uses uppercase letters A through Z. In predicate logic, however, capital, capital uppercase letters don't represent statements, but they represent predicates. And I'll talk about what that means here in a minute. We're also going to introduce lowercase letters, and we have two types of lowercase letters in predicate logic. We have lowercase letters A through W. That's individual constants representing a single object, an entity, or an individual. Um, and that's as, as opposed to a, a lowercase letter x, y, or z, which is a variable that stands for one or more objects that range over a certain number of objects. And I know this is going to be really confusing right off the bat. We're going to look at some examples here in a minute to make this clear. So again, we have uppercase letters a through z. Those represent predicates. In other words, claims that are true about certain objects. We have lowercase letters a through w. These are individual constants that stand for or represent a single object, an entity, or an individual and lowercase letters x, y, and z. And these are variables that can stand for or range over one or more objects. In addition to, to those uh, uses of letters, we also have what are called quantifiers. And I'll, again, I'll dive into some examples to make this clear here in a minute. But there are two types of quantifiers in predicate logic, what's known as a universal quanti quantifier and an existential quantifier. Sometimes the universal quantifier is represented by an upside down a and an x. Your textbook just uses it as an X in, in, a, in a set of parentheses. So when you see an X in parentheses, that's a universal quantifier inside your textbook. And the existential quantifier is a backwards E, capital E, and, uh, and an X. Again, don't worry too much about this just yet. I'll talk about what this means in a minute and how this applies to some, some specific examples. But there are two types of quantifiers in predicate logic, universal quantifiers that range over a number of objects and existential quantifiers that refer to a particular object. We also um, uh, still use the propositional logic operators. This is an important point that predicate logic is an addition onto, onto propositional logic. All of the propositional logic operators, the tilde, the dot, the wedge, the horseshoe, and the triple bar, all of those are still used in predicate logic. You can think of predicate logic as a, as a superset of, of propositional logic, um, uh, a more nuanced version of, of, of propositional logic where you need to get more fine grained and break apart those statements into their subjects and predicates. But we still use if then statements, we still use either or statements, we still use negations and so on and so forth. So in other words, predicate logic builds on propositional logic, it doesn't replace propositional logic. Okay, let's go ahead and dive in. I want to talk first of all about simple statements and predicate logic. Now simple statements are statements that have a subject and a, and a predicate. So here are some simple examples and some examples of how those capital letters and lowercase letters are put together to represent a complete statement in English in, in predicate logic. So here's a very simple example. Garfield is a cat. 
So we said right off the bat that lowercase letters A through W are going to represent individuals, represent objects. So here we're going to use the lowercase letter G to represent Garfield, to stand for that object or that entity or that individual Garfield. And we're going to use the uppercase letter C to represent a predicate, what we're saying about that individual, namely that that individual is a cat. So again, just to recap here, we've got two components to this statement. We have the subject, Garfield, and we have the predicate, is a cat. Again, this is hopefully English Grammar 101 for all of you English speakers out there. And the way predicate logic works is we put those together to make a, com to make a, a complete statement in predicate logic. Now in predicate logic, the predicate actually comes first and the object or objects that that predicate applies to comes second, which is actually in, sort of unfortunately backwards from the way that English normally works. In English, we normally put the subject first and the predicate second in most simple statements. But here in predicate logic, for reasons that will become clear as we move forward in the class, the order is actually reversed. The predicate comes first. So we're saying this predicate C is a cat applies to this object, lowercase g or Garfield. And this unit together, CG, is a complete statement in predicate logic. The predicate is a cat applies to the object Garfield. In other words, Garfield is a cat. Let's look at a few more examples. Here's a fun one. Harry Potter is a wizard. So let's let lowercase h, which is an individual constant. We said, remember, lowercase letters a through w stand for constants, which represent individual objects or entities or individuals. Let's let lowercase h stand for the person, Harry Potter. Now, the predicate here is, is, a, witter, is a wizard. So let's let uppercase w stand for the predicate is a wizard. And again, just as in the previous example, the predicate comes first, capital W and lowercase h. The predicate is a wizard applies to the object or the entity h, Harry Potter. In other words, Harry Potter is a wizard. Here's a fun one. Idaho Falls is in Idaho. Let's let lowercase i stand for the city, Idaho Falls, the object or entity, Idaho Falls, the city. And let's let capital letter i stand for the predicate is in Idaho. So here, putting these together, again, the predicate comes first, capital letter I, followed by lowercase letter I, that's going to mean Idaho Falls is in Idaho. In other words, the predicate is in Idaho applies to the entity Idaho Falls. Another couple of examples, William Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. So here, let's let lowercase s stand for the person, William Shakespeare, and let's let capital letter R stand for the predicate, wrote Romeo and Juliet. Putting those together, again, the predicate coming first, R, lowercase s, that stands for the predicate R applies to the individual S, or William Shakespeare. In other words, William Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. Right off the bat, you need to be really, really clear about how capital letters are used versus lowercase letters are used. Make sure that you're using lowercase letters, A through W, to stand for individual constants. We'll talk about variables here in a minute and the uppercase letters A through Z are used to represent predicates, no longer complete statements as we did in, in propositional logic. And I'm kind of a history buff, so this last one is my, my addition here. Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor. Let's let M stand for Marcus Aurelius, and let's let uppercase letter E stand for the predicate was a Roman emperor. Putting those together with a predicate first, you get capital E, lowercase m right here. That stands for the predicate was a Roman empire, applies to the individual represented by M or Marcus Aurelius. In other words, Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor. So again, this unit here is a complete statement. EM means Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor. That has a truth value, just like simple statements in propositional logic with capital letters had a truth value, except now that the, we're breaking that, that statement into its fundamental components, the subject and the predicate of that statement, and treating that as a unit instead of, a lower, instead of an uppercase letter standing for a complete statement. So these are some examples of simple statements in predicate logic. There are lots of examples of these in your textbook and in your homework. The first third of your homework or so are just simple statements like this. Get some practice with these. Make sure you get a handle on how capital letters and lowercase letters are used in predicate logic. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about are the difference between uh, universal statements and particular statements. Again, we're not going to worry about logic yet. We're just working, worried about different kinds of statements in English that we're going to represent using uh, predicate logic notation here in a minute. So a universal statement is a categorical statement, but it makes a claim about every member of a class or a category. So here are some examples. All cats are felines. That is making a claim about every member of the class, cats or, or, um, and felines for that matter. 
It's basically saying everything that's a member of of uh, of the cat the class of cats has this property. It's also a feline. So it's making this broad general claim about everything that falls in that category of cats. Same thing with the next example. All dogs go to heaven. I don't know if you remember that movie or not. It was a movie back when I was a kid. But this is making a general claim about every member of the category or class of dogs, right? It's making a claim about all dogs, not about just a particular dog or some number of dogs, every dog inside that class of dogs. So those are affirmative uh, universal statements, but they also can be phrased negatively. For example, no pumpkins or gourds. Um, that's making a general claim about all pumpkins saying that all those pumpkins don't fall in the category of gourds. And we, in English, we say something like no pumpkins are, are gourds. But this is another type of universal statement because it's making a claim about all pumpkins. A negative claim, some property they don't have. No good deed goes unpunished. So this is, again, making a general claim about all good deeds, namely that for any given good deed, it doesn't go unpunished. <clears throat> So that's what makes these statements universal statements. They're making a general claim about every member of the subject class or the subject category. Now that's as opposed to particular statements down here. Particular statements make a claim about one or more particular members of a class or of a category. Sometimes particular statements are described as existential statements. That means they make an existence claim about a, a particularly existing object or entity inside of a, a particular class. So here are some simple examples. Some mobile devices are tablets. So this is not making a general claim about all mobile devices. It's saying that there are at least some mobile devices, some number of them inside this class of mobile devices that are also tablets. So again, this is a particular statement because it's, it's not making a general claim about all mobile devices. It's making a claim about one or more particular uh, uh, items inside that category, some particular mobile devices. Here's another example of cats. You can tell I'm a cat person, so I'm always, always using cat examples. Some cats are orange tabbies. So this is not making a general claim about cats. Compared to this example up here, all cats are felines, that's making a claim about every member of the class of cats. But down here, some cats are orange tabbies. It's not making a claim about every member of the class of cats, just some particular members of the class of cats, namely that they're also orange tabbies. So that's what makes this a particular statement. It's making a claim based on a category, but about particular members of that category, not about the category as a whole. Uh, just as above, there can also be negative particular statements. So for example, we have some presidents do not have strong ideals. This is not making a claim about all presidents. This is making a claim about one or more particular presidents that they don't have strong ideals. Same thing with the next example, some colleges are not universities. This is not making a general claim about all colleges. This is making a particular claim about one or more specific colleges that are not universities. So that's a fundamental distinction in predicate logic. There are two types of categorical statements, universal statements and particular statements. So in predicate logic, we need a way of representing both of these types of statements in, in symbolic notation so we can work with them formally and do things like proving arguments that rely on, on, on uh, categorical relationships are valid using deduction methods and so on and, and so forth. So let's look at how to represent universal statements in predicate logic. As the name implies, you can guess that we're probably going to use the universal quantifier to do that. So I, I'm going to talk through this specific example, and then I'll, I'll uh, spend a minute descri describing some of the things that are, you should keep in mind when you're, when you're trying to represent universal statements in predicate logic, some common patterns that you'll uh, rely on. So here's a very simple example. All cats are felines. So we said that we're going to use capital letters to represent predicates. So let's let CX stand for X is a cat, and let's let FX stand for X is a feline. Notice we don't have a particular object to be named here. We don't have anything like Garfield with a particular name. So that's why we're not using individual constants. We're just using predicates. So um, what this uh, uh, statement is saying is that take anything you want in the universe. If it's a cat, then it's also going to be feline. For anything at all, if it's a cat, then it's a feline. So what I've done here, I've translated into logical notation using a universal quantifier. This universal quantifier binds or governs the statement that's immediately to the right of it. The, not the statement, but the expression that's immediately to the right of it. So it basically says, for all x, and that's how you should translate this universal quantifier. It basically means for all x, for any given x. For all x, 
if x is a cat, then f, x is a feline. And this is a common pattern that you're going to use when you're translating universal statements. Generally, universal statements are translated with a universal quantifier, and then the expression that's bound by that universal quantifier to the right of it is usually in the form of a conditional. And I think you can see why. Uh, if you look at the um, kind of rejiggered uh, English translation of this in logic speak, look at how I'm pronouncing this. For all x, take anything you want. If that something is a cat, oops, excuse me, if that something is a cat, then that something is a feline. And that's exactly how I've translated it in logical notation right here. It says, for all x, take anything in the universe that you want. If that x is a cat, then that x is also a feline. And this is a way of representing universal statements in logic notation. Um, for, so again, just the hallmarks here, you're gonna, when you have a, a universal statement, you're gonna, generally going to use the universal quantifier, and inside that you're generally going to have a conditional. And if you look here, the antecedent of this conditional is the subject of this, this sentence we were given, cats, and the, the uh, consequent of that conditional is the predicate, what we're saying is true about that group of individuals. So that's why this quantifier said to range over individuals. This, this X ranges over everything in the universe. It says, take anything in the universe that you want. If it's a cat, then it's a feline. So we'll get more examples of this here in a minute, but I want you to keep this basic pattern in mind when you look at any universal statement whatsoever. So here's another one, no cats or dogs. Now notice this is a negatively phrased universal statement, but it's still making a claim about everything in the category of cats, namely that they're not dogs. So we've got two predicates here. Let's let CX stand for X is a cat. And let's let DX, again, with a capital C and capital D, stand for X is a dog. Notice we're using lowercase letter, letters as variables to stand for the objects in that category. And the quantifier basically indicates what range of objects that X stands for. Does it stand for a particular object or does it stand for every object? And the universal quantifier says this X is standing for every object. So let's see, we're basically saying, making a claim about all cats. So we're saying, take anything you want. If that something is a cat, what are we saying about it? Well, we're basically saying, if it's a cat, then it's not a dog, no cats or dogs, right? So, but the subject here is cats. That's why we have CX as the antecedent of this conditional inside the expression governed by that universal quantifier. And what we're saying about it here is the consequent of that conditional. It's not the case that it's a dog, so it's so not dx. And notice here's an example of how we're using propositional logic operators here inside predicate logic. And I really want to make this point that predicate logic does not replace propositional logic. It builds on propositional logic, um, allows you to make more fine-grained distinctions, but the propositional logic operators still hold in predicate logic as well. So again, let me uh, read this statement in English. These two statements are equivalent. If you're saying no cats or dogs, you're essentially saying take anything you want for all x, for any given x. If that something is a cat, then that something is not a dog. And that's equivalent to this first expression. So what predicate logic is doing is giving kind of a, a semantic interpretation, a formal semantic interpretation of the precise meaning of these statements in English that, are, that have this categorical property, these universal statements. But again, all universal statements are generally going to have this structure. There's going to be a universal quantifier. It's going to bind some expression. And, the, and that expression inside is going to be a conditional, where the antecedent of that conditional is the group that you're making a claim about. And the consequent of that conditional right here is what you're saying about that group of objects. OK, let's move on and talk about particular statements in predicate logic by contrast. Now, if you remember, uh, we started out by saying there's a distinction between universal statements and particular statements. Universal statements make a claim about every object, whereas particular statements make a claim about one or more particular objects inside of a class. So here's an example of a particular statement. It doesn't make a claim about all cats. It makes a claim about some number of cats, some particular, some particular cats inside the group of cats. So here we have a statement, some cats are orange tabbies. Uh, it's always important to list out your predicates so you know what the uh, statements stand for. Let's let C of X stand for X is a cat. Let's let O of X stand for X is an orange tabby. So um, before we look at the translation, let's look at this um, kind of rejiggered, re rewritten uh, English uh, statement at the bottom of the screen. If you're saying some cats are orange tabbies, what you're saying is that there exists at least one object, at least one something, at least one X, such that that object is a cat, 
and it's also an orange tabby. It has two things that are true about it. There exists at least one thing that has both of these properties. It's a cat and it's an orange tabby. And you can see why I've translated this into predicate logic the way I have. First of all, I use the existential quantifier. That says I'm making an existential claim. There exists one or more particular objects that have the properties that follow. So again, just in contrast to the universal quantifier, the universal quantifier doesn't say anything exists. It says for take anything you want, anything in the universe, it has a certain set of properties. Um, the existential quantifier says there exists one or more particular things. It makes an existential claim. That's why it's called the existential quantifier. So this says there exists at least one X, at least one object, let's call it X. And that object has two properties. First of all, it's a cat and it's an orange tabby. So C of X and O of X. And generally this is the way that particular statements work in predicate logic. You're gonna have an existential quantifier that says, there exists at least one object that has a certain set of properties and then you're going to start listing out the properties that that object has and you're going to connect those together with a dot because and i think you can see why in this translated uh, explanation down here we're basically saying there exists some object and it has two properties it's a cat and it's an orange tabby that's why we're using a conjunction here inside this uh, expression bound by the existential quantifier. And generally existential statements are gonna have that property. We're gonna have an, an existential quantifier. We're gonna have a, a statement, um, an expression governed by that existential quantifier in parentheses or in brackets. And you're gonna have dot, a dot inside that existential quantifier. The left side of the dot is gonna be the subject of the, of, of the, the particular statement, in this case, cats, right? Some cats, that's why we have CX here on the left. And the expression on the right side of the dot is going to be the predicate or what you're saying about that object, namely that it's an orange tabby. So there exists some X, some object, some particular object. That's what the existential quantifier says. I want you to really remember this point. The existential quantifier says there exists at least one thing. Let's call it X. And it has two properties. It's a cat and it's an orange tabby. But particular statements are generally going to have this form. You're going to have an existential quantifier and you're going to have some expression governed by that quantifier and th that expression inside is going to have a dot and you're going to list out the things that are true about that object. Let's look at another example. Here's a negatively phrased uh, particular statement. Some cats are not well behaved. So we have two predicates at play here. We have C of X or X is a cat. We have W of X or X is well behaved. And here's my translation. There exists some object X. So there, again, if, if you look at this, the structure of this original sentence, it says some cats are not well behaved. That implies there exists at least one cat that has this property, right? So there exists at least one object X. And what are the properties that this object has? Well, first of all, it's a cat and it's not well behaved. So it's not the case that WX. And again, just structurally, this expression WX is, a, is equivalent to a, a statement in, in propositional logic. It's either true or false. That's why you can put a negation in front of it. So we have, there exists some object X such that X is a cat and it's not the case that X is well behaved. And you basically see that's how I've rewritten my explanation or my, my, tran, uh, my transliteration of my, my logic translation down below. There exists at least one object X such that, this is a really crucial phrase for Kind of talking through the meaning of a, of a propositional or, or a predicate logic statement and you can kind of see how it works here there exists some object x such that and then what follows such that is what follows that existential quantifier x is a cat and x is not well behaved so c of x and not w of x but again it follows this pattern that you're going to see over and over and over again for existential or particular statements you're going to have an existential quantifier that's this bit here in parentheses as, as shown in your textbook and previously in the video. And then you're gonna have this expression to the right of that existential quantifier. And generally for particular statements, that expression is going to be a dot. There are some exceptions, but this is generally the, the form for particular statements. So let's look at a few examples. These range from mind bogglingly simple examples to fairly complex examples. We're just gonna look at a few of these examples together, the kinds of examples that you're gonna get in your textbook. There's no way I'm gonna cover all the different variations of particular statements and universal statements. Um, I should say right off the bat that one thing that's really hard about English is all of the variety that we get. We have many ways of saying the same types of expressions in English, and some of them are unfortunately misleading. Like, for example, 
If I want to make a claim about all cats, like the example we used before, all cats are felines. One way I could say that in English is a cat is a feline. I could say a cat is a feline. I'm not talking there about a particular cat, even though I've used the singular phrase, a cat. I'm making a general claim about all cats, even though I've phrased it using the particular sounding phrase, a cat. So and it's very, very, very important that you keep these quirks of English in mind as you run through the uh, examples of predicate logic statements and translations in your homework. Some of them are purposely designed to be misleading, to make you think that it's a particular statement when really it's a general claim that's being made about every member of a class. But that's the fundamental question that you should ask yourself. Is the statement in question making a general claim about all members of a particular group or a particular class, or is it making an existential or particular claim about one or more particular members of a, of a class? That's the distinction between a universal statement and a particular statement, and that's what will um, be the deciding factor for whether you translate a statement in, in, as a universal statement with a universal quantifier or an existential statement with an existential quantifier. So here's an example of just a simple statement in predicate logic. No quantifiers. It's not making a claim about any group. It's just talking, making a particular claim about, about Nancy here. So Nancy is not a sales clerk. So again, we're going to use lowercase letters A through W to stand for particular individuals or objects. So here we're letting lowercase n stand for Nancy. It's as an individual constant is what your textbook calls it. And we're going to use the capital letters A through Z to stand for predicates. And here the predicate is S, capital letter S is going to stand for is a sales clerk. And all we do is put those together. So if we want to say Nancy is a sales clerk, we would just take ca the capital letter S and follow it by a lowercase n. That would say Nancy is a sales clerk. But here we're saying Nancy is not a sales clerk. So we're going to use the tilde, the negation symbol in front of that. So Nancy is not a sales clerk. So here's, again, a great example of how um, a, 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 an uppercase letter and a lowercase letter together can make up a statement in, in predicate logic, because statements have subjects and predicates. Again, I hope I don't have to explain this too much. This is like basic, basic grammar, right? A statement has a subject and it has a predicate. So here, a complete sentence is a, is a, uh, a predicate and a subject together. And you, and you can treat that just as you would a, a statement in, pre, in propositional logic. So if we want to negate that, we just put a tilde in front of it and that negates that statement. But again, we're breaking that statement into its components now rather than treating it as a, as a single uh, capital letter like we did in, in predicate logic. A very simple example. Slightly more complex example. This also makes the point that you can uh, combine statements in predicate logic using the propositional logic operators that you already know. So here's a statement. Rachel is either a journalist or a newscaster. This is saying one of two things is true about Rachel. Rachel, Rachel is either a journalist or she's a new, newscaster. You could actually break, you know, kind of spell this out a little more. You could say either Rachel is a journalist or Rachel is a newscaster. But let's talk about the letters that we're going to use. We said that we're going to use a lowercase letter, A through W, to represent the individual. So here we're using a lowercase r to represent Rachel as an individual, as an individual constant. Um, <clears throat> we have two predicates here, is a journalist or is a newscaster. So let's use J and N to stand for those. Capital J is going to stand for is a journalist. Capital N is going to stand for is a newscaster. And this statement says one of those two things is true. Either Rachel is a journalist or Rachel is a newscaster. And that's how I've translated it here. JR stands for this predicate is a journalist applies to Rachel. So Rachel is a journalist or this predicate N is a newscaster applies to Rachel. In other words, Rachel is a, a newscaster. And of course, we use, we've used the wedge before. The wedge represents an either or statement. So either one of these two expressions has to be true. Either Rachel is a journalist or Rachel is a newscaster. Fairly straightforward example. But again, it makes the point that basically the structure of predicate logic is almost exactly the same as propositional logic. You can use all the same operators, just that what counts as a statement is the combination of a subject and a predicate, just like you get in ordinary language statements. Okay, so let's look at another expression. This one's a bit more complicated than the previous one. Belgium and France subsidize the arts only if Austria or Germany expand museum holdings. So the very first step involved in translating is to list out all of the individual constants that you're gonna need and their definitions 
and all of the individual predicates you're going to need and the definitions of those predicates. We said we're going to use lowercase letters A through W to represent individual objects, entities, or individuals. And we're going to use uh, uppercase letters uh, A through Z to represent predicates, things that are said about those objects. So here we're going to need four individual constants, one to represent the country Belgium, country France, country Austria, and the country Germany. And we're going to need two predicates. Notice that we have two predicates at play here. Something subsidizes the arts or something expands museum holdings. And I've listed these out for you here. Let's let lowercase letter B stand for the country Belgium. Lowercase letter F stand for the country France. Lowercase letter A will stand for the country Austria. Lowercase letter G will stand for the country Germany. And we said we're going to have two predicates here and we're going to use capital letters for the predicates. Um, uppercase S is going to stand for something subsidizes the arts and uh, uppercase E is going to stand for something expanding museum holdings. Be really cautious here. It would be very easy to accidentally use uppercase letters for these country names, but we said that we're going to use lowercase letters to represent individual objects or entities and we're going to use uppercase letters to stand for predicates. So here it's very important that you use lowercase letters to represent the country names, even though the country names start with a capital letter in English. So let's see what we have. Let's talk about the first part of this, this statement. Belgium and France subsidize the arts. <clears throat> it's a conjunction, right? The very first part of that is a conjunction. It says Belgium subsidizes the arts and France subsidizes the arts. And that's what I have in the first part of this expression here. Uh, let's let SB stand for Belgium subsidizes the arts. Again, we're saying this, the predicate S subsidizes the arts applies to the entity B, which is Belgium. And um, that same predicate subsidizes the arts applies to the entity represented by F, which is France. So Belgium and France subsidize the arts. That's what's going on in the first part of this expression here in parentheses. Only if, and if you remember, only if is translated as a conditional. So here I have a horseshoe to represent that only if. And only if what? Either Austria or Germany expand museum holdings. So I have parentheses here as the consequent of this conditional. Only if what now? Uh, Austria expands museum holdings or Germany expands museum holdings. This isn't either, the second half of this expression is an either or statement, right? Austria expands museum holdings or Germany expands museum holdings. And that's what I have here inside parentheses as the consequent of this conditional. <clears throat> either the uh, predicate E expands museum holdings applies to the entity represented by A, which is Austria, or that predicate expands museum holdings applies to the entity represented by G, which is Germany. So again, kind of now focus just on this, uh, bring my pointer back, now focus just on this expression in logic notation. This says Belgium <clears throat> um, subsidizes the arts and France subsidizes the arts only if, because only if is used to specify a necessary condition, only if this expression on the right, which is an either or statement, either Austria expands museum holdings or Germany expands museum holdings. So a perfect example of how you can combine uh, statements in predicate logic where you're breaking apart the subject and the, pre and the uh, predicate of a, of a statement, combining those with propositional logic op operators just as you've done before. So this should look very familiar. All we're doing is breaking apart these simple statements into their subject and predicates. Okay, let's keep going. Here we have a, a simple universal statement. Anything that leads to violence is wrong. This is making a general claim about anything in the category of things that lead to violence, right? It's a universal claim about everything in that category. We're going to need two predicates here. Notice we don't need any constants because we're not talking about particular objects now. We're talking about everything in a particular category. So this is why we're using variables instead of constants, why we're using an X instead of some other letter. We're going to need two predicates. Let's let capital L stands for something leads to violence and capital letter W stand for something is wrong. We said that when we translate universal statements, we're going to do it with a universal quantifier. That's what you have here for all X, in other words. And then what follows is going to be what you're saying about that entity. And so um, this statement is basically equivalent to this. Take anything you want for all X, for any given X. If that X leads to violence, then that X is wrong. So for all, for basically the, what's interesting here is this is a claim about everything in the universe. Take anything in the universe that you want. That's why it's such a, that's why it's called a universal claim. You're making a claim about everything in the universe here. <clears throat> for anything in that, in the universe, 
if that something leads to violence, then that something is wrong. In other words, everything that leads to violence is wrong. Notice how this statement follows this, the pattern we described earlier for universal statements. We've got a universal quantifier that governs some expression that is uh, bound in parentheses or bracket. And that expression that's bound is a conditional. The antecedent of that conditional will correspond to the subject of the statement that you're given. So anything that leads to violence, right? You're making a claim about everything that leads to violence. So that's why this predicate L of X is the antecedent of that conditional. And the consequent of that conditional is what you're saying about that object. In other words, that it's wrong. So again, for all X, for any given X, if that X leads to violence, then that X is wrong. So this is a statement that is true of every statement in the, of every entity or in every object in the universe. If that something leads to violence, then that something is wrong. That's why it's called a universal claim, making a claim about every object inside this category. Another way to think about this is that the antecedent of this conditional serves to restrict the group of objects that you're talking about. You're saying, take anything in the universe that you want. All of those things, the things that lead to violence, some subset of that larger universal claim leads to, it ends up being wrong is the, the predicate that you're saying about it. In any case, universal statements will all, almost always have this pattern, a universal quantifier governing some conditional, the antecedent of that conditional will correspond to the subject of the uh, universal claim and the uh, consequent of that conditional will correspond to the predicate of that universal claim. Okay, here we have not a universal statement, but a particular statement. It's a claim not about all dogs, but about some dogs. Some dogs bite if and only if they are teased. So let's first of all, list out all the predicates we're going to need, which I've done for you here. We're talking about dogs. So we're gonna need some predicate to represent an object being a dog. So let's let D stand for something as a dog, capital letter D. Capital letter B will stand for something bites. That's another predicate at play here, right? Some dogs bite. Only if they're teased. So we're gonna need something to represent something being teased. So it's like capital letters D, T stand for something is teased. Now we said that for existential statements or particular statements, we're gonna use the existential quantifier. And again, I want you to get in the habit of talking these statements out to yourself. This says there exists some object X. There exists some particular object. That's what the existential quantifier says. And I think you can see that that, that, in, that follows from the meaning of the statement. You're making a claim about some dogs. You're saying there has to exist some dogs about which the statement that follows is, is true. So there exists some object X. Now, what do you know about that object? Well, first of all, it has to be a dog. So DX. And now notice uh, we said that whenever you're translating particular statements, you're generally gonna have an existential quantifier. You're gonna have some expression in parentheses or brackets, and you're gonna have a dot. And ba basically because you're an existential statement says more than one thing is true about a particular object. It says, the, you know, first of all, the subject clause, in other words, that object is a dog. And then what follows about it? Now here's something complex is being said about some dogs. They bite if and only if they are teased. So let me read this statement to you in, uh, uh, that, that I have in logical notation here in English and I'll show you how it's built. There exists some object X. That's what this universal quantifier says. Such that, that's usually how you uh, phrase the, the expression that follows an existential quantifier. Such that, that X is a dog. That's what it says you're talking about dogs. And what's true about those particular dogs well, they bite if and only if they are teased. And the, the phrase if and only if should be clear by now. This was uh, a review from when we were talking about um, uh, biconditionals in, in uh, propositional logic. But an if and, only, if and only if statement is a biconditional. So there exists some object X such that that X is a dog, first of all. And then this expression is true about those particular dogs. They bite B of X if and only if, there's your biconditional, T of X, they are teased. And um, so again, just to break this apart, we've got an existential quantifier that says we're talking about some particular objects. First of all, they're dogs. The left side of that conjunction is the subject of the uh, uh, particular statement that you're given. So here's some dogs. That's why we have D of X on the left side of that conjunction. And the right side of that conjunction is what we're claiming, excuse me. The right side of that conjunction is what we're claiming about those dogs. And here we're claiming that for those dogs, they bite if and only if they are teased. So the right side of that conjunction is a complex expression. That, those objects bite if and only if those objects are teased.
So let me just read this in logic speak now. There exists some X such that X is a dog and X bites if and only if X is teased. So this is a, an example of a, of a particular statement, but one that's a bit more complicated than a, a simple uh, particular statement. Okay. Here we have a deceptively uh, simple looking uh, statement in, in English. It's a universal statement. A good violin is rare and expensive. Now, what's interesting about this example to me is that this is a universal claim. It's making a claim about good violins in general, even though the English phrase, a good violin, <clears throat> excuse me, sounds like a particular expression. So here's where you have to be really careful. The, the meaning or the semantics of this statement is a claim about all good violins. It's not a claim about some particular violin, right? So that's why we're translating it as a universal statement. So the first thing I want to do is list out all the predicates, predicates I'm going to need. Here I'm going to need capital letter G to stand for something being good, capital letter V to stand for something being a violin, capital letter R stand for something being rare, and capital letter E to stand for something being expensive. So we said that for universal statements, we're going to have a universal quantifier, which I have right here. We're going to have some expression. Here we have to have brackets because we're going to, this is a fairly complex expression. But that expression is going to be a conditional. We said the antecedent of that conditional is going to be the subject of the, the universal statement that we're given. And the consequent of that conditional is going to correspond to the predicate of the universal statement that we're given. So let's see how this works. We're talking about good violins. So we're going to have make a universal claim for all x. And the antecedent now are all the properties of that uh, class or group that we're defining that we're making a claim about. We're talking about things that are good and things that are violins. So for all X, if that X is good and that X is a violin, and then we're going to have the conditional, like I said, the consequent of that conditional is going to be what we're saying about those objects. We're saying that anything that falls in that category, everything that falls in that category is both rare and expensive. So the consequent of this conditional, we're going to need some parentheses because we're saying two things about it. We're saying those objects are rare and those objects are expensive. That's why here I have objects are rare and the object is expensive. So let me, again, I want you to get in the habit of pronouncing these categorical statements and logic in this way. So I want you to pay attention to what I'm doing here and try to get in the habit of pronouncing predicate statements in this way. For all X, if X is good and violin, then that X is rare and expensive. See what I did there? I'm basically making a claim about everything in the universe. I'm restricting it to things that are good and violins. And then I'm saying, if something falls in those categories, something that's good and a violin, then it has these predicates. It's rare and expensive. But again, just to drive this point home, for universal statements, you're generally going to have this, this structure, a universal quantifier, some expression in parentheses or brackets. That expression is going to be a conditional. The antecedent of that conditional is going to be the group that you're talking about, in this case, things that are good and things that are violins. And the consequent of that conditional are going to be the predicates that you're claiming are true about those the objects in that group, namely here that they're rare and they're expensive. That's why I have a conjunction inside parentheses there. Um, but it follows the basic pattern. Universal statements are going to have a universal quantifier and a conditional. And we said existential statements are going to have an existential quantifier and a conjunction. Generally, that's true for almost every universal statement or um, a particular statement. Here we have a very complex expression. Don't let the logic notation down below scare you right off the bat. I'm going to talk you through it right now. Experienced mechanics are well paid only if all the inexperienced ones are lazy. And this is an example out of your textbook, and you're given four predicates here. Let's let uppercase E stand for something being experienced. Let's let uppercase M stand for something being a mechanic. Let's let uppercase W stand for something being well paid. And let's let uppercase L stand for something being lazy. Notice we don't need a separate letter for inexperience because that's just the opposite of experience. And we can use a tilde to say the opposite of that. So we actually don't need a separate letter for inexperience because we already have experienced. Uh, we're not going to need any individual constants. We have, we, there are no claims here about a particular mechanic, you know, by name. So we don't need any constants. All we need are these predicates. Um, let's see what we've got here. What I notice about this, here's where you have to be really, you know, you want to go slow and you want to make sure you really understand the structure of the sentence. Experienced mechanics are well paid. 
that in itself is a universal claim about all experienced mechanics, right? It says that universal claim holds only if, now this is what's interesting, you actually have a propositional logic operator here. And what follows only if is all the inexperienced ones are lazy. And that's actually a separate universal claim. All the inexperienced mechanics are lazy. So what we know we're gonna have right off the bat is some universal statement about all experienced mechanics, this propositional logic operator representing only if, and another universal statement here, all the inexperienced ones are lazy. So I, you can see I have another universal quantifier here, another universal statement in predicate logic. And these two universal statements are connected together by this horseshoe, which is what's going on in the original English with only if. Let's talk about the first part of this expression. Experienced mechanics are well paid. This is a universal claim about all experienced mechanics, right? We said when we have a universal claim, we're gonna use a universal quantifier. That's what I have dangling way out front here. And that's gonna govern everything in the brackets right here that I'm underlining on the screen right now. The bracket before the parentheses and this bracket that ends uh, following uh, WX. We said that inside that bracket, we're gonna have a conditional. The antecedent of that conditional is gonna to correspond to the subject of that universal statement. So here we're talking about experienced mechanics. So for all X, where that X is a mechanic and that X is experience. So this expression in parentheses here serves to define the group that we're talking about. If something is a mechanic and it's experience, then, and the consequent of this conditional, what follows this horseshoe is gonna be the predicate that's said about that group. They're well paid, WX. And that is gonna end the first universal statement, the first half of this, this expression in English that we're given. Then we said only if, so I have a horseshoe here to represent that there are two universal statements being connected by this uh, only if phrase. Uh, and we said, uh, we're gonna have another universal statement. All the inexperienced ones, what? Inexperienced mechanics are lazy. So again, we're gonna need a universal quantifier for all X. We said that that universal quantifier is going to govern a conditional. The antecedent of that conditional is gonna be the group that we're talking about. We're still talking about mechanics. So if that, if, if, if basically saying for all X, um, if that X is a mechanic and it's what? inexperienced or not experienced. So if it's a mechanic and it's not experienced, then what are we saying about it? It's lazy, LX. So again, just to uh, drive this point home, here we have two universal statements that are connected together by a, a horseshoe and an only if expression. Each one of them uh, has a universal quantifier that governs some expression and that expression that it governs is a conditional. The antecedent of that conditional will serve to define the group that you're making a claim about, and the consequent of that conditional is what you're saying about that group of objects. So let me read this in logic speak. <clears throat> For all X, if X is a mechanic and experienced, then X is well paid. Only if, for all X, if X is a mechanic and X is inexperienced, then X is lazy. So again, I want you to get in the habit of pronouncing these universal statements in this way. For all X, if X has a certain property, then X has some other set of properties and so on and so forth. Anyways, this one wasn't too bad, but I think when you first encounter this, this could be really overwhelming. You might not have imagined that it would have this complex of a meaning from this few words in English, but I think you can see why the, why the, the structure here is important. You need to serve to restrict this group of objects that X refers to, to some particular group. And that's what we have here. So for all X, for anything in the universe, you have to restrict it to talking about experienced mechanics, and then you can get around to saying what you're saying about that object. And same thing here with the inexperienced ones. For all X, if something is a mechanic and it's inexperienced or not experienced, then it's lazy. So fairly, I think you can see that statements that are you know, fairly simple in English can have fairly lengthy semantics because they're actually saying something quite complex in a fairly small number of words in English. And this is a frustrating aspect in English and a frustrating aspect of learning to represent the structure of English statements in predicate logic notation, something you need to get a lot of practice on in this week's homework. I think you have probably um, 30 or so statements you'll have to translate as part of your homework this week, none of which should take you very long, but be on the lookout. A lot of them are really deceptive in the way that this previous example that we looked at was, was uh, um, uh, deceptive, trying to trick you into thinking that it's a particular statement, but really being a universal statement. So uh, be on the lookout, go really slowly through the, um, the exercises in your homework and ask yourself, is this a claim about a particular individual by name? Is this a claim about 
every object of a certain category or some unnamed specific entities inside of a, of, of a specific category. And that'll dictate whether you represent a statement with uh, just as a simple, simple predicate logic statement with no quantifiers, as a universal statement with a universal quantifier, or an existential particular statement with a, an existential quantifier. Okay, I've got another example for you here. Some employees will get raises if and only if some managers are overly generous. Now notice here that these are two particular statements that are connected together by an if and only if. Some employees will get raises. That's a particular statement about some employees, one or more employees. If and only if some other particular statements, some managers, some particular managers, excuse me, are overly generous. So again, we don't have any uh, individuals by name here, so we're not going to need any lowercase uh, uh, constants. We are going to need um, variables because we're talking about particular unnamed, uh, you know, people in these categories, and we're going to need capital letters for predicates. So let's let capital letter E stand for something is an employee. Capital letter R will stand for something gets a raise. Capital letter M stands for something is a manager, and capital letter O stands for something is overly generous. So let's talk about the first part of this expression. Some employees will get raises. Just, just focus on that for the moment. That's a particular statement. So we said when we have a particular statement, we're gonna use an existential quantifier because that says we're talking about some actually existing particular thing, one or more things. And in general, I, um, I didn't say this when I was talking about the existential quantifier, but the, the meaning of the existential quantifier is usually at least one. There's at least one thing that has this property that's gonna come, one or more. One in particular, but at least one. Uh, could be two, could be three, could be four, but there's at least one object that has this property. So at least one employee will get a raise. In other words, some employees. So some doesn't have to be plural. In English, some almost connote that there has to be at least two. But in logic, some means at least one. There's at least one particular object. So we said that uh, when you have a particular statement, we're going to use an existential quantifier. And we're going to use an expression that's a conjunction, where the left side of that conjunction is going to be the subject of the group that we're talking about, and the right side of that conjunction is going to be what we're claiming about those particular objects. So there exists at least some one thing, at least one x, such that first of all, x is an employee, e of x, and that x will get a raise, r of x. That's the first part of this expression in English. There exists at least one exists at least one thing such that that something will is an employee and that something will get a raise. Then we have an if and only if. So that entire expression, which is a statement in English, again, this is a predicate logic statement, if and only if this other predicate logic statement, some managers are overly generous. In other words, if there exists some such X such that <clears throat> X is a manager and X is overly generous. So there exists some X such that X is a manager and X is overly generous. But you can see that this expression follows the same pattern that we've been talking about for existential statements. And this is what's, you know, if, if English is, is complicated and frustrating because of its complexity and because of the many ways that it says the same basic meanings. And if predicate logic is a little scary looking because this is a lot more complicated than, than propositional logic, at least to the eyes, you can rely on these basic patterns that work almost all the time. Here we have some particular statements. Some managers are overly generous and look how it exactly follows the pattern we've been talking about. We use an existential quantifier. There's a conjunction. The left side of that conjunction is the subject, some managers, and the right side is the uh, predicate, what we're claiming about that group of objects, that they're overly generous. It follows the pattern exactly. So that hopefully should make up for some of the complexity of dealing with predicate logic. These patterns are used over and over and over and over again. If you don't recognize them right off the bat, if you're doing just a few homework exercises after today, after you do your, your homework for this week, these patterns should become quite ingrained to you. You'll see them again and again and again, and something you can almost rely on, like clockwork and doing predicate logic. Um, with some exceptions that we'll talk about when, when we get that far, but I want you to focus on these basic patterns. So again, we have two separate existential statements and both follow the pattern we just talked about. They're connected together with, an, with a, a biconditional to represent this if and only if, and that is how you translate this statement in, in predicate logic. Okay, so just to recap, let me back up a bit here. Um, you're going to do a lot of examples for your homework. I, I can't cover all the nuances of every example you're going to look at. And struggling with them is part of the part of the fun. Definitely, if you have any questions, let me know. 
Um, if you get stuck on any of your homework exercises, if you want some clarity about whether something should be translated as a particular statement or as a universal statement, you need to be pointed the right direction. I'm definitely happy to help. But again, just to reiterate, these are the components of a predicate logic statement. Uppercase letters A through Z, these don't stand for statements anymore. These stand for predicates. Lowercase letters A through W, these are individual constants that represent a single object, entity, or individual. As distinguished from lowercase letters X, Y, and Z, which are individual variables, and those variables are generally bound by quantifiers, one of two different kinds of quantifiers. Universal quantifiers for universal statements, statements about every member of a particular class, uh, as opposed to existential quantifiers, which represent particular statements or existential statements about one or more particular but unnamed um, entities inside a particular object or, or class. Also, we're going to use the same propositional logic operators we've been using up till now. Don't forget about those. And generally, there are two types of statements in predicate logic, universal statements and particular statements. Universal statements tend to look like this. All cats are felines, no pumpkins are gourds. You can see that they make uh, a universal claim about every member of a, of a particular group or particular statements that make a claim about one or more particular members of a category or group like this. Some mobile devices are tablets. Some cats are orange tabbies. They're making a claim about particular entities inside that class, not the class as a whole. For universal statements, you're gonna use a universal quantifier that governs some expression that's a conditional where the antecedent of that conditional will correspond to the subject of the statement you're given. And the consequent of that conditional will correspond to the predicates that are being claimed about that group. For uh, particular statements, you're going to have an existential quantifier because that's what says we're talking about our one or more particular objects inside that class that actually exist. It makes an existential claim, which is why it's called an existential quantifier. You're going to have an existential quantifier that governs a conjunction. The left side of that conjunction is going to be the subject class, some cats, and the right side of that, that conjunction is going to be the predicate or predicates that are claimed about that object in this case, orange tabbies. But generally, for an existential statement, you're going to have a string of conjunctions, whereas for a universal statement, you're going to have a conditional. The left side might be a string of conjunctions to define a particular class, and the right side of that, that conditional might be a conjunction to, to list out all the predicates that are being claimed about that group. But generally, you're going to have this pattern. When you have a universal statement, excuse me, when you have a universal statement, you're going to have a universal quantifier with a conditional. And when you have a particular statement, you're going to have an existential quantifier with a conjunction. So the challenge in predicate logic, at least in translations that you get for your homework this week, is not going to be in remembering these basic patterns, although you do have to remember them. It's a little bit of a challenge, something you have to acclimate to. All of the challenge is going to be how to take this really particular quirky structure of natural language in English and represent that using one of these two basic patterns uh, for, for universal statements or existential statements and where to put the negations of something is, is, uh, is uh, being negated if you have the opposite of one of the, one of the predicates and where, how to combine them together using the propositional logic operators you already, you already know if you have, a, if you have one or more, um, either one or more predicates that are being, being given or more than one uh, uh, predicate logic statement connected together with propositional logic operators. So that's a challenge for your homework. Um, you know, when you submit your homework, you know, if you if you have any you struggled with, again, um, don't be afraid to let me know. I'm happy to give some some feedback or some insight and point you the right direction. But I'll give lots of feedback on your homework too, because I really want you to get get um, uh, firm in this connection between natural language and and how to represent the quirkiness of English in in, in natural language in this fairly rigid structure of predicate logic. I think you can see that you know, where predicate logic is useful is drawing out all of the nuances of the meaning of a fairly ordinary sounding expression. And some of the nuances are, are more complex than you might have thought. And that's one thing that logic can help with is making sure that you are representing exactly what you mean to say when you're saying something in natural language, if you keep the semantic interpretation and logical semantic interpretation in mind when you're reading or writing. In any case, that's all I have for you today. Um, again, keep in mind those two basic patterns. Get lots of practice on your homework this week. Definitely let me know if you have any questions on any of the, of the homework exercises. I'm happy to help point you in the right direction. We could always jump in a Zoom meeting, jump on the phone, whatnot, to, to look at any examples together. Happy to help. Otherwise, hope you guys have a great week. Get lots of practice on your homework. Get your homework to me by 11.59 p.m. on Sunday night. And I hope you guys have a great week. Thank you very much.